Okay, everybody, this is Kevin Lockett once again. Today, we are talking to Stacy Spikes, CEO of Movie Pass, founder of Urban World Film Festival, uh, a man of a thousand faces. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Spikes, uh, welcome to our show today. Hey, Kevin, thank you for having me. Before we begin, I want to thank you. Because like you, I also worked in a uh, video store. You worked in what sound warehouse or something like that. Yeah. So I, yeah, yeah I worked at a yeah yeah I worked at a video store where music was playing in the background, and that's where our paths diverted. Because basically, you wrote my autobiography if I was on Earth two. <laughs> ah, <that's great. laughs> you did everything I wanted to do. I was like, somebody has to live my life, but who? <laughs> Yeah. So it you did me, it. Man. It was you. Yeah. So while I was stumbling through this, like, oh my God, yeah, this is my life. <laughs> this is how it was supposed great. to be. Yeah, that's great. Where where were I, you? <laughs> I, I worked at a place called Hot Tracks. It was by the University of Akron. And I worked there in the afternoons. And yeah. it's great because I hate because all the blockbusters are gone. You just hate the the feeling of going to a video store. Looking yeah. at the videos, talking to people, getting the ideas of how videos are. Like it's I, I think that's the one thing kids just don't have. They have a lot of communities yeah. today, but that interpersonal yeah. thing where you're talking to you have yeah. your regulars come in, you kind of say like, you know, tell you how they gave, gave you reviews because everybody's everybody back then was Roger Ebert or Gene Siskel. So it was a good time. It was a good time. Yeah, then. you 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 were the official um recommendation section back in the day you know i was a uh, brief story mm -hmm. before we get to you for a second uh yeah. i remember we had uh ice t's um uh what's that what's that metal band he had um oh yeah i know what you're talking about yeah yeah. One, yeah it was sitting there for months just collecting dust and then one day the, the yeah. controversy happened and people say hey you got that cd it's like it's been here for months what do you mean yeah <laughs> <laughs> nobody, nobody wanted it back then, but now everybody, everybody, we back ordered it. So yeah, that was good times. Oh yeah, yeah, that's yeah. great. Yeah, there's a there's a thousand stories like that, you know. It is, it is. So the reason we're talking to you today is twofold. We're, we're going to talk about Movie Pass, but also your book Black Founder, uh, the hidden power of being an outsider. Um, but we before we get into all of that, um, there's a person I want to acknowledge in your book. And she's not even in the index at all. Yeah. But if it wasn't for this person, we wouldn't be speaking today. And that's Mrs. Frank, Mrs. Fry, Mrs. Fry, your oh, uh, yeah. high school counselor. Yeah. How yes. important was she on your path uh, to success? So the backstory was I was in high school and I was in a band and, you know, you're, you're the second generation who's going to go to college. And so, and my father was a principal, so there was no negotiating with that. And Mrs. Fry says to me, she was my my high school counselor, you know, where are you going to go, what are you going to do? She said, you really have to follow your dreams so that you don't regret your life. If you do stuff that other people tell you to do and it doesn't work out, it's worse. And I never forgot that. She says, I can't tell you what to do. And I wanted to go to Los Angeles and follow my dreams. And that was not in the cards for my parents. And um, she made a suggestion and I did. I followed my dreams and my trajectory went in a totally different direction because of what she said. I think as a career counselor, if my daughter came home and said, hey, a career counselor told me I should just drop out of school and go follow the Grateful Dead, I would, I would be like, what? Um, but in a sense, that's kind of what what she did. She said, you know, follow your dreams. And uh, and like you said, in that alternative Earth 2, I ended up on a totally different trajectory. Yeah, we called it Kevin Lockett. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah, but it's, it's, that's why uh, education and counselors are so important. Like, I, I, it saddens when I hear counselors who don't advise their students to just dream big and just kind of follow. Because at that age, you should experiment, right? You have the rest of your life to, to take a regular yeah. job. and do. Uh, but at that point at 18 years old, you have no idea. So you have any type of dream, you should follow it. Yeah, that hundred percent. And I, I agree with you. That's the time to experiment when there's not family and kids and mortgages and all that other stuff. If there's a time you're going to try it and maybe fail and, and reroute your course and you're not going to fail because to go get that life experience is wonderful anyway. But. 
What was your original plans? What was your ultimate goal when you decided to go to uh, Hollywood? What was the long term goal? What did you envision? Man, this thing? I back then it was here's Spike Lee, here's Denzel, and there was some music stuff. Like I really liked what Steel was doing back in the day, and I I kind of wanted to be one of those triple threats. Like, well, I liked all of this stuff, and um. I'd say first I wanted to act, second was music, and then, you know, I'm going to just go figure it out. But that was that was my goal, was to be in front of the camera one way, shape, mm-hmm. or form. One of the things that you did when you first moved out there, you had a various jobs. So one of the places you worked at was Power Sports American Video. And yeah. you mentioned in the book that there are some things, and there's like there's a great guy in that book, Lou Drosen. I love that guy. Yeah. I don't even know him, yeah. but the, the whole back yeah. backstory of that is fantastic. Yeah. But what are you mentioned in the book how there were things that you learned back then that you still carry today? Yeah. What things did you learn back then at Power Sports? You know, it's funny. So Lou Drosen was he was originally at he created Laugh Records, and he was um, a guy who had been around the comedy scene for a long time but red fox richard pryor leroy and skilly skillet mom 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 mabels um they were all on his label when they started so it was a powerhouse comedy label and um so when i get to this place lou had all of these masters in his office of uh, uh nightclub acts that were never released you know they would often record you know they the the comedians would work the material out and then mm-hmm. eventually go do the big show at the end and they would record that but he'd have all these good recordings man to be able to sit in his office on um, the real to real play those were the original recordings and so i got to relive this history and i think what was so powerful was to hear how black comedians could address racism as jokes but what what they were joking about was not funny at all right but Mm -hmm. they were able to deal with it in a ha 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 kind of way that uh, i think allowed us to laugh at what we were dealing with in america um so it took a lot of that away with me and it, it gave me a sense of pride and courage that if these people could have the courage to say this to the establishments um, and and address those things that I could have the courage as a, a young person starting out to go fight for my dreams just like they had to in a time that was much harder than what I was coming up in. Right. Those comedians, a lot, they don't get enough credit. I think at, at one point they did, but as the years go along, yeah. I think people are forgetting about them and all the stuff yeah. they went through. But the brilliance... Yeah. The brilliance of how they were just able to just keep come up with these jokes, saying doing social commentary at the same time. It, it, they were just brilliant yeah. performers. It, it, it's it's still good to see. You know, we have some parts of that where you still have Paul Mooney, and you have have a few holdovers. And I think you know when uh, when Eddie did uh, that film that he just did not too long ago, where he was paying homage to those guys. You know, mm-hmm. that, that that's a part of our history that it, it was a civil rights movement. So the one that got the most popularity was songs. And uh, here's the, tempt, the Temptations and here's the Four Tops and here's Gladys Knight and here's uh, Diana Ross and here's all that where black kids and white kids could both be listening to the same music. But it was really funny because black people and white people were listening to these comedy albums, but we we didn't mix. We were listening to them separately. And white people were able to listen to it and be like, what? And black people were able to listen to it and be like, yeah. You know, he's he's saying <laughs> yeah. what I'm thinking. And yeah. but they would they could say it so raw that that's what comedy is really great. You know how Chris Rock his last show, Chris was able to say things and call them out that uh, you know is an art form, and and so yeah, it's 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 something that really is an amazing talent to be able to do that just the right way. 
Right, right. So after uh, the video plays, um, here's the thing that's interesting. So I interviewed Dave Zirin, and we was talking about his book about Jim Brown. And Dave was saying how he could have wrote five different books about Jim Brown because he met, he led very different lives. You're almost like that in a lot of ways because you worked at Motown, Sony, Miramax, and October Films. You could have wrote a whole book on just the, on, about, about the, about the uh, movie studio, a whole book about the recording industry, right? The, the, the ability to do all of that is amazing to me. So being an outsider, watching all this stuff um, from a pop culture standpoint, what's the similarities and differences between working for a record company and working for a movie studio? Oh, uh, wow. That's a, Kev, I don't think anybody's ever asked me that. Um, <clears throat> I'd have to say music was... So you could you could have a song in the studio, drop it on wax, or even take, you know, burn a CD, go to the club or go to the station. And if back in the day, if the phones lit up or they rushed to the floor, you knew you had something and you could go finish it and then boom, release it. Um, a movie has more moving parts. It's not as reactionary meaning you can't you gotta put all your chips on the table sure you can do some focus groups and do some editing but for the most part it's made it's done and so music was spontaneous where cinema had a lot more believe time and i think in some ways it's harder because you don't see the pieces like you can, I, I've been in the studio with a whole lot of artists laying down tracks and you're sitting there and you're just like, yeah, first there's that beat and you're like, and then they start dropping on top of that beat and you, you feel it. You can feel the goosebumps. You're right there when it happens with movies. It's like, okay, shoot the scene, add in the music, layer in the, the sound effects. Like there's all this stuff that has to get stacked and mm -hmm. you really don't, you until it all comes together and that's a much harder thing to do um, so it's a different art form with a different set of disciplines a lot more money at risk um, and so that's what i would say the big difference is on mm. i'm a superhero nerd so i always love uh, origin stories so the origin story of urban <laughs> the urban world film festival is amazing to me because it oh, started wow. it started because of the original kings of comedy and a meeting that you had with a Sundance director. Yeah. yeah. It was, um, so we had, I was at Miramax at the time, so I was an executive. And I was getting tapes and things from, you know, young filmmakers and parents, mothers saying, our child is sleeping in our basement and made this movie. Could you take a look at it? Because I shown up, I was in Ebony and, jet is this executive and one of the few you know executives of color and so it was really funny because um all of a sudden i get all of these tapes coming to me and i feel the responsibility that i need to do something i need to give back and be able to help and so i figured all right i'm gonna go to sundance sit down with them and say hey let's 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 have a little urban division or something like that, or, or, or a screen or something. And the head of the festival at the time said, you know, if there was any good work out there, we would show it, but there's just not good stuff. And I said, according to who? <laughs> and I developed a resentment and that was it. I was like, you know what? I'm seeing stuff that's good. And I think that we need to create a home that we're the ones deciding that's good, not they're deciding that's good. And we need to make a festival that's for us and by us. And that's how Urban World got started. You mentioned Ebony and Jet. I have to flash back to your parents, like when you first told them you were going out to Los Angeles. So what was it like, like years later when they saw you in these different magazines that you were like this big time executive? What was that like? It was hard because my, my father would go, but what do you do? <laughs> so with that, you know, I, I do this, I do that, I do this, but he came from another world. I think it's a little like today if some, your kid 
comes up and says, I'm making an app. You know, what's an app? How, how did, what time do you show up for work each day? I, well, you don't, I just sit on my computer and I, I make an app and it's, it's so it's, it was very foreign because it wasn't a location you went into, you punched in on the clock. It was, you helped make music and films and you market them across, you know, cable network at the time. It wasn't digital airways yet. And, you know, you, you promoted your movie across MTV, you know, or you promoted your album off these radio stations and how you got airplay and how you got the band to play on the tonight show, things like that. And they were mystified by it. You know, they would, I remember once we had boys to men on the tonight show and um, I think they were performing Motown Philly. And I was like, explaining to my parents, okay, they're going to be on the tonight show, but let me tell you my part of how that happened. And they were just like, I don't, I don't know what you do. And then I think showing up in the trades like Ebony and Jet and Black Enterprise, even if they didn't understand what I did, they started to cut me some slack that I didn't go to college. I think it's hard for parents. You know, I, I think I think you're right. Like when it, it was like my, my dad's the same way. So it's not like they weren't supportive of things like that. They just they just can envision what you were up to. And, and you gave a great yeah. analogy about creating an app or doing about doing the podcasting. You could tell people, but if they're from a different generation, it's just hard for them to fathom. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. So it's interesting. One of my favorite, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Um, One of my favorite pages of your book, and your book is great, is page 171. And 171 is a very crucial page to me because it it gives you the insight what it's like to be a black man um, Mm -hmm. in a boardroom trying to get funding from from a venture capitalist in various meetings, especially when you come to meetings when people don't look like you. And you had a great stat, you had a great stat in there where, you, where it's like 3% of venture capital funding goes to women and minorities. And it feels yeah. like it's been 3% since the Obama administration. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm just looking for six. If you double it, it's ah. only 6%, which is not a lot. <laughs> 6% is double. nothing. <laughs> it's, but it's at least double. it's double. Right. What is it going to take for the Silicon Valley and just venture, venture capitalists and, 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 as, as a whole <laughs> to just say like, okay, Here's some money. You have some great ideas. Because there's a lot of people who get money, who burn through their money, yet they get more funds. What is it going to take for them to really look at minorities, especially African-Americans? It's like, okay, we're going to take a chance on you because we believe in this idea. You know, I think it's tricky. What I like about in our history, when you look at sports, um, sports had a level playing field. So if you run how fast you do a, a quarter mile, um, or how fast can you run 20 yards and, and make, make a left or right cut? How many, you know, buckets you make in a, in a game? And what's easy about sports is if you help the team win, the team sells more tickets and the owners make more money. Black or white, they don't care. What's a little vague is imagine if sports kind of had an athlete needed to prove themselves. They kind of, there is a little bit of similarities in this, but if they had to prove themselves and then a whole bunch of people all at the same time needed to agree on Michael Jordan versus one team and he joins that team. And so VCs don't come alone. They travel in packs and, and, and in their pack mentality, they want um, to all believe in the same thing, that this can be successful. And so they start to develop a pattern recognition bias. I choose not to call it racism, because I think if, if Black people start hitting the ball out of the park with making certain apps, people will follow that success. And so you saw how... Uh, when it came to musical artists, well, people are like, well, well, shit, you make money here. So they'll follow the green when there's pattern recognition, but building startups in tech is very hard to get you. 
it's just so hard to get up that hill for the massive amount of capital you need to break through the stratosphere that people even know. There's, I think, 41,000 apps, like, you know, some crazy number um, to be a top 10 app. And that's the part that's challenging to break through that. One of the unsung heroes of your book, and there's many, um, is a guy I would like to talk about for a minute, is uh, Hammett Watt. And I like Mr. Watt because he is a black venture capitalist, which is yeah. something that we don't we don't see it in Forbes too often. We don't see it in Fortune. We don't see it at CNBC. So it's 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 almost refreshing and, and interesting to, to read about him. Tell me about Hammett Watt and his importance to your uh, your career. Yeah. So I mean, I met. Um, I got introduced to him through some mutual friends. We we were in the same circles. I was trying to get movie path up on its feet and um, we had a call one day and before the end of that call, we were finishing each other's sentences. And sometimes going the entrepreneurial route, you need teammates. You need people that are going to help do it with you and um, be on that path with you. And, and I may came on board. He helped raise our first million um, and he really put the, put the company on the map to be able to get going. If it wasn't for him, there's I, I don't know that we would be here. Uh, apologize to me. I didn't know that's how you say your name. So please apologize to him for me. <laughs> I apologize. Well, I you, you just did. You just did. That's it. Uh, so since we're here, uh, for people who don't know what MoviePass is, can you tell us what MoviePass is? Yeah. So MoviePass was the nation's first theatrical subscription service that let people uh, go to the movies as than as they wanted for one low monthly fee. And I was the, you know, original co-founder. Um, and we, it was born in 2012 and took it all the way to exit in 2017, uh, left, um, a private equity group bought it and they went out of business with it. And then, uh, last fall, I bought the company back and we've since relaunched it and, and getting it back up on its feet. Your story kind of reads like Steve Jobs in a lot of ways because he was in the same position where he yeah. co-founded a company. The board down the road said, eh, we don't need you to <laughs> get rid yeah. of you. Yeah. And then Jobs came back. Um, and you, but you chose to, so it's, the story is interesting because in the book, it, it, it details that there was a story, uh, there was a documentary produced by Mark Wahlberg, which was going to be the rise and fall of movie pass. And then along the way, years later, after you left, they told you, Hey, Stacy, you could buy it back if you wanted to, yeah. it's, you know, it's in bankruptcy. What, what made you decide to buy it back? Because you had already started working on pre-show, I believe. Yeah. So what made yeah. you decide to go back to movie pass? Cause some people might have just what pushed that aside and, and went another direction. Kev, you did your homework, man. I don't think you, uh, <laughs> you, de- <laughs> you read everything. Uh, yeah. you got great. I'm, I'm, I got my book over here. I'm like, did that really? <laughs> um, <laughs> I try to uh, do my best. Yeah. No, you, you got great. Um, so yeah, the, the, what had happened was the, uh, Mark Wahlberg, production company decide to make a documentary that's supposed to come out at the top of next year on HBO. And um, what was interesting was they were interviewing certain people and they said, hey, we just heard that in the bankruptcy filings, no one bought movie pass. And, and one of the producers was like, wouldn't that be crazy if you bought it back? And I was like, ha ha, ah, come on. And the minute we hung up the phone, I was like, doo, 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 doo. I was like, hello. Um, and found out that in fact it was not purchased. I put in a bid and the bid got accepted. And so bought the company back. Yeah. What is that process like? Because we hear about companies, people who buy bankrupt companies before. Like, is that a long process? Or do what's the what's the levels of that? Yeah, it, it was easier and trickier than I thought. So easy is you, you basically um, put in a bid. Um, it's an open bid. And so they can't, someone can counter your offer. So the, the, what they do is they publish 
there is an offer by this company to buy this entity. Is there any objections or any competitive bids? So they'll list that online or in a newspaper somewhere where the general public can see it. And then anyone who wants to can competitively bid and or object. So let's say I was a slumlord and I was working on a building that was in bankruptcy and someone said, hey, He's a terrible slumlord. Don't let him buy it. And, and in the in the public good, if I'm one of the competitive bidders against someone who has a really good record, they may turn around and even if that person is at a low level, they may give that win that bid to the person who has a better track record of how they treat the renters. So you have a public statement that anyone who wants to speak out against the purchase can. And you have to wait for 21 days for either of those things to happen. And um, and the bidding process is like a, once they counter, they don't tell you where they countered, but you need to exceed their counter by a certain level. So it kind of prevents you from really knowing. It, it helps move the price up because that money is going to go back to pay any any creditors or debts that that company created. And um, so that was a process and we wait for 21 days and then a judge either grants or, or grants it to you or grants it to someone else. And you, you find out at that moment and after 21 days, we got a call from the courts and they said, you won the, the bid and you get it back. Cause you have to put your, you have to put a portion of your money in escrow if you mm -hmm. collapse the, if you run away from the deal, they keep that escrow. I think you have to put twenty or thirty percent in escrow, and so then you pay the balance off, and that's the process. Wow! You, uh, before you rebought Movie Pass, uh, you mentioned that you were meditating. You use meditation a lot. Um, how did you get into meditation, and what do you tell people who have busy minds, who are creative people? Because I've tried meditating before, and sometimes it works, but your mind is so busy and racing the thoughts, it's just kind of hard to kind of slow all that stuff down. Yeah, so I've always played around with it. I, I've lived in New York for oh, many years now, but when I was in L.A., so I went from Houston to L.A. and then to New York. Um, you know, the, the crazy thing was uh, I, there's this great meditative practice. So you pick a phrase, you have 10 words. And you pick a phrase, and my particular phrase is be still and know that I am one of the dot. So you take that phrase and you say it in your mind and you press out the last word. So in this case, it would be God. Then you inhale and you remove be still and know that I am one with. And you press out that word. And you meditate on what that final word is in your phrase. And then eventually you get down to just the word be. And so what's deep about that approach is you give your monkey mind a job. So it doesn't get to go roam off and do other things. And you teach it how to, I want you to say this sentence. I want you to take a word off and say the sentence again. And I want you to think of how those sentences are different. And then when you get down to the bottom, and then you go back up, you go be, be still, be still and, be still and know, you know, and you go back up. And so, I, so once I got that meditation, it takes me about 10 minutes, maybe 15 if I really want to go slow. And it really centers my mind pretty fast. And that, that's something that I love to do. That's how I do it. I'll give, I'll give that a shot. I've been using apps, so usually the raining apps usually kind of helps, but I'll, I'll try yeah. that. Um, yeah. In between Movie Pass and Urban Urban Film Festival, you had Urban Films. And I guess the, yeah. the question that I would like to ask, it's almost like a timing question. Would you have rather started Urban Films when it was little competition, but the bandwidth was horrible? Or would you have rather started, if you were doing it today, do it today where the bandwidth is great, but there's a lot more competition when it comes to streaming? Wow, you have some great questions. My answer, if I did it with the streaming, 
is when the when the content wars began you don't see any small players in that game you see the only players are people with deep pockets and if you will they're they're giving away the content in order to have you on the platform there's this nuclear arms race to get you in their um and create a better relationship whether amazon and everything in that stack apple everything in that stack netflix everything in that stack um disney and once you're in their kingdom they can sell you more things and do more things so i'd say maybe i could take the earlier version only because once the smoke cleared other than netflix was so early out and the timing was just right with the emergence of the ipad and the iphone and the and the 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 4G, the 3G and the 4G network that you had the speed to watch. Because I don't even think Netflix realized those technological advancements were coming. They didn't, they weren't there. They, they, net, if you get it, Netflix movies on the web was maybe the most. And if you think back then, it was like, okay, I'm going to watch a movie on my laptop. Maybe that's the idea. And um, so the iPad and the phone and the, the speed wasn't there, but luckily they were they were marching in the right direction and everything caught up in the right time. But other than them, there were startups that are playing in the streaming game, right? They're all major, major content creators, major studios, ma major... Uh, Fortune 500 companies. So I'd maybe take the earlier version. I don't deep pockets. You got to have deep pockets to make it work. Right. Speaking of Amazon and Disney, this is a movie theater question. So recently in Akron, they got rid of two of our regal cinemas. So we're down to one. Yeah. And he said, yep. well, if you still want to go see our films, you could drive out to the suburbs. I was like, I don't want to go to the suburbs. <laughs> yeah. I want, I want yeah. to keep it in Akron. Yeah. Yeah. So I remember like last year or the year before, I think it was last year, there was a rumor that Amazon was going to buy EMC theaters. And uh, that sounded kind of cool, but it didn't happen. Do you think that might be the next step when it comes to movie theaters where you have these big players like Amazon and Disney buying up movie theaters? Because I really feel like the movie experience, I mean, the movie theater experience is still a great experience. Streaming is great. Streaming is wonderful. But it's nothing like going into a theater. So what do you think the future of cinema, uh, especially when it comes to theaters, is? I, I think I think that's great. I mentioned it in the book. Uh, I think that having a big, so, so look at it as the live experience of the movie industry, right? So the music industry has the recorded content, and then it has the concerts, right? So your favorite artist is coming to town, you go see them, you're going to go see Taylor Swift, you're going to see, you know, um, I don't know, whoever else, uh, you're going to go see Drake. And it's like, you, the, the people that go to the concerts are going to end up with a unique experience that you're not going to get just listening to the album, even if you know. Well, going to movie theaters is like that. It's the concert of the film industry. And I don't think it's ever going to go away. And I think if, I do believe at some point a subscription company would be highly likely to buy a theater chain and uh, have their subscription go on device, in home, and in theater that you pay, whether it's your Prime or your Apple or even say your Disney or Netflix account, that you might be able to move from one end to the other and use that subscription accordingly. I think people like myself are trying to figure out the right model for the theatrical window. But once that's figured out, I can't see that a big player is not going to gobble up who figured out that model and gobble up, say, uh, 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 theater itself. I think that I think that's going to happen. Do you think something like Ac uh, Apple Vision Pro with the virtual reality? Do you think? I mean, it's expensive now, but when the prices go down, 
Do you think VR will be more of a integral thing when it comes to new, to streaming and and movies, where you have someone only have like a a surround sound visual experience about everything? Oh, look at that, <laughs> <laughs> man! I, I'm already there. I, I'm I'm in there. I I am in there almost daily, and I got to tell you, the experience is already there. I watch movies, I watch content mm-hmm. in it, um, and I and I I totally believe that the um, that it is going to. I think I think that the VR headset is going to do to movies what the iPhone and the i iPod did for music. I believe that. I believe that. I think that it's going to bring IMAX capability to your home. Uh, that's amazing. I didn't expect you to bring out the, v- the VR headset. I was like, I'm going to ask a very professional question. <laughs> it's like, look at this sucker. <laughs> that no, is a- no. You're, you're asking the right thing because look, I think I think imagine if the music industry ignored the phone or the iPod. Imagine if they just turned their head and said, no, we do. And I think, I think, are you in the movie? I believe I am in the business of connecting content cre- filmmakers, content creators, and audience in a in a communal type way, if it can be in a live event, but I'm not limited to, well, if it's in VR, am I going to do it? I think that where I don't play is I'm not a, um, I, I'm, so once you get into streaming, the, the, the consumer and the, the, um, the consumer and the creator are in a direct relationship. But when you're in the live event space, you still have a layer that something like movie packs can play play in because there is a, a ticketing layer because it's a pay-per-view or it's a subscriptionized relationship. There's room for someone like us to play. And that's where I think whether you're watching it in VR or you're watching to get on your headset or in theater that you can do both. What film have you watched in there that really tripped you out? That really was like, wow, this is even more amazing than I thought. The best one which they outfitted for was Ghost in the Shell, the live action Ghost in the Shell. That was probably the first one I rented and watched in there. And um, now I'm, I'm one of those weirdos that when I'm flying sometimes, so I, I have the new, the new Oculus, um, the new Meta head, new Meta Quest Pro, blah, blah, blah. Um, I have been that on the airplane, sitting there like that, watching an IMAX level uh, while I'm flying. I'm flying in the sky. So. Yeah. Uh, you're, you're so busy. You're doing so many different things. Um, I like asking balance questions. How do you balance being a very creative person? You're a CEO. You have multiple organizations and businesses. But at the same time, you're a loving husband and a loving father. How do you balance all of that? Um, because you're still a very creative, animated person. But you're over here, you got this. I think you had a line in your book where you said you used to um, um, live to work. And now you work to live after you had your daughter. And that's like a very touching, that's almost like a baby face lyric. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's a very short, yeah. touching line, but yeah. it's true. Like, you know, how, how do you balance yeah. all that stuff? You know, I think when, when you get out in the world and you're that go getter and it's just you, you're like, man, I'm gonna make a stack of chips. I'm going to have the bat and whip. I'm going to, I'm going to have my airplane. I'm, I'm, <laughs> watch me right and you 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 head out and then you add another minute but you got dream your your partner and then you add a kid or some kids to that and it shifts because then you realize now i'm this and even if i hit those 
am, 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 I, am I, I'm giving it away to the next generation. I can't take it with me. So can I make the, can I make this world a better place? There we go. Michael Jackson and Peyton face all in one. There you and, go. Um, and so the, 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 so I'm starting with the man in the mirror because I want to change my ways. I'm just kidding. I'm you do. It's, it's too, too much. <laughs> <laughs> so the, so, but, but having that around you changes your point of view and you end up realizing the work you're doing is really to pay it forward and make opportunities for who's coming next. And then your worldview becomes less selfish. You kind of, I think, see a God's eye view of how do I help everybody rather than just get my, and it's all about me. Hmm. Speaking about changes, how have you seen the evolution of the, Urban World uh, Film Festival because it's still going on. You know, unfortunately, we don't hear about it as much. I mean, but it's still out there. They, I mean, just, yeah. if you're want to submit films, that's closed, unfortunately, for this year. But you still have next year. But how is it you see it evolve from the from the time you started to and where it is now, 2023? You know, it's it's gone through a lot of changes. There was like a world where there was black exploitation, but there was hardly any. Um, black movies but we kind of saw hip-hop roll through and then you saw <clears throat> black cinema really rise up in urban world was part of that and you know uh tim story malcolm lee ava duvernay rosaria Dawson, like all of these cats that kind of kind of came up through urban world and you saw this really big swelling of of our presence in our movies and then you started to see more and more where our talent was in, um, they, they started to go into other movies and be part of, you know, big ensemble pieces. And so we haven't seen as many of the Stella Gata grew back, What If Who's Fallen in Love, Original Kings of Comedy, Next Man. So you haven't seen as much of that in every mainstream, right? And now I think you're starting to see it come back where those live audiences and making content for, for those audiences, like you see uh, faith based and you see um, where they're starting, you know, those they're coming back, but they're really needing to focus on those groups. The horrors are um, there's that film coming out um, that that spoof on the horror flick. Uh, Is it the blackening or something the, like that? The black and the yeah, exactly, yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. So that's an example where you're not starting to see niche marketing come back, and it's because theatricals coming back, and the big tent poles are doing what they do. But now that bottom market is is starting to become healthy again. So you're seeing everything come back around, and um, this will be Urban World's 27th year, which is kind of crazy. To think that that's you know it's been that long. I was only five years old when I started Urban World. Well, that and, makes me um, four. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You was a mere toddler when it started. Yeah, exactly. um, you mentioned you mentioned the best man, and when it came back on Peacock for the the, the series, yeah. um, the great, yeah. great, great business. Um, what do you see the future of streaming? Because there was a big spike. You know, the pandemic was horrible, but it was a big spike in streaming. You know, I was a big fan of WandaVision yeah. and all those shows. But then yeah. it is dipped a lot. So where do you yeah. see it going moving forward? I mean, in streaming to me, so television, right? So long ago, the number of TVs were larger than the number of screens. And then the the TV got smaller. Um, and it's on you went to a, a computer and then you went to a tab a phone and a tablet. And so it's not it's not going to get smaller again. But I think what spatial computing and VR now my computer is going to be this big, and and now it opens up another world. So I think that gives streaming another life, right? A different dimension when it comes to the content side of streaming. Now I can really get that experience of uh, scale that you couldn't get on a phone or a tablet. Um, so that's a, that's a good thing for streaming. 
that being said, I think that there's ways to still tie in the line because seeing a horror movie. So I don't know if you got to see Nope in theaters. Yeah. Um, yeah. But when you see Nope or, or The Blackening or, or, or The Conjuring or any of these things, with like, man, it's just nothing like it. It's nothing like seeing it in my house. Um, when you go see, I went to see the new Spider-Man in IMAX with an audience full of people. Um, I, I went to see The Little Mermaid. Everyone sang every single song. There's just nothing like that. You know, it's a beautiful communal experience. Um, and and so I think, I think they're all here to stay, but there's this constant morphing. Everyone who puts the obituary for cinema, I think, is always writing early. I think that's always been a thing. I'm sure when the home video popped up, they said the cinema was going to die. When DVDs popped up, they said the cinema was going to die. When Blockbuster was like killing everything, I'm sure they said yeah. the same thing. Same thing with Redbox. Yeah. Like, I think it yeah. happens. I think cinema is one of those things that's never going to die. It'll take its, like anything else, it'll dip, take its dips, but it'll come back in a different yeah. form. Yeah. yeah. It's the, it's the king of the hill and everybody takes stocks at it. And, you know, because it is the king of the hill. So what do you do for fun? Like, are you just a like, full-fledged pop culture person? Because you see, like, you got to have some fun someplace that has nothing to do with pop culture in your family. So do you do anything or is it just all pop culture all the time? You know, um, I read a lot. I love reading biographies. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, um, I, excuse me. Um, I love reading biographies. I I'm I love going camping. My family we're we're really big campers. We like going out, pitching a tent in the forest or you know somewhere in the woods, and that's a beautiful experience. When our daughter was like one or two, uh, we had another family. We got into that. The summer's coming, so we have some wonderful camping days. Um, and and oddly enough. What do I do for fun? I love going to the movies. Um, if I'm not reading, if I'm not listening to music, if I'm not playing in VR, I'm at a movie theater. Those are my, that's my fun. Uh, Atlanta this last season had a great uh, episode when they went camping. So for people who are beginner campers, do you have any advice for, for us non-campers out there? <laughs> I do. Gear, gear, gear. It is all about your gear. Um, what's great about the internet now is you can do all your homework. Um, so I, I do what they call car camping. So to break down kind of like the three ideas, there's backpacking. You're going to take what you want, walk into the forest, set up, and take it all out with you. Uh, car camping, you're going to go to a campground, drive up, unpack your car or truck and do all of that there. And similar, except your backpack is a 4,000 pound vehicle. And then there's RV camping where you can kind of go anywhere, go to state park, go anywhere, and you have your home convenience and you don't need anything. But we're tent campers. We like to tent camp. We tried RV camping. Um, and we just kind of like that feel of the tent. It's like it's it's a little more rugged, um, and it gets you a little bit closer to nature. And I would say you want to be ready for the rain. You want to pack in a way that you are smart and learn your gear. And it takes a little little while to get your gear right. Um, like, okay, if a rain comes, do I have a tarp, one of those light tarps to put over my tent? just in case, um, uh, how do I keep my shoes dry? You know, little, little stuff like that, but you can watch videos on it and you kind of start with what is your tent? Are you going to be a knot? Are you going to be a canvas? Or then you build out from there. And uh, I still think about one day writing the book on uh, camping, but there's plenty of smart modes out there already. All right, I'll, I'll I'll write all this stuff down when I go go camping about five years. <laughs> okay, <laughs> don't wait, don't wait. No, I'll not wait. It's just uh, I I used to go camping 
when I was younger, like a little bit. Yeah. And it's like, oh my God, the ground is so hard. I need an air mattress. So I need to work yeah. on my, uh, yeah. I, I had too much Whitley Gilbert in me, I guess. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Those, those air mattresses are important. All right. Uh, well, our conversation is almost over, but what I want to kind of talk about the title is Black Founder, um, The Hidden Power of Being an Outsider. Uh, this is for professionals and for young adults. I mean, a lot of times you're told, like, you have to be on the inside. You have to be an insider. That's the way you're going to succeed. And again, yeah, you got to you have to be part of the game and be an insider. But there's a lot of power of being an outsider. There's a lot of benefits of being an outsider. Can you give us, uh, especially for professionals and for kids who might be listening to this podcast, uh, what are the advantages of being an outside person? Yeah, so great question. You, you, you're full of wonderful questions today, Kev. But, um, you know, the thing about the being an outsider that you get, you have a unique point of view on the situation. Sometimes you're not clouded with process. And so you can see something very clearly. There's an old joke I like to tell people whenever I'm speaking. So there's a um, there's three generations of of family over for Thanksgiving, and the the granddaughter says to the mother, "Mom, why do you cut the butt off the chicken uh, when you put it in the oven?" And uh, the Daughter says, I don't know, you should go ask your grandmother. I just did what she did. And she goes and asks her, and, and the grandmother says, I don't know, I did it. What my and eventually they realize the original oven was so small that they had to cut part of the turkey off to get it in the oven. And they just mm. kept doing the same thing over and over. Well, sometimes that being on the inside makes you do things the way it's always been. being on the outside you see a unique way of doing it because you're not burdened by that and that gives you an advantage because the goal of any new business is to do it cheaper better faster right but sometimes the legacy products is like we've been doing it this way a thousand years we're going to change it now and that's what being an outsider can give you an advantage. And a lot of times people think because I'm not on the inside, I don't, I, I don't have an opportunity when actually you do. Um, you know, so many times innovation never comes from established big verticals. It always comes from a little person on the outside who says, but why don't we do it this way? You know, you look at, you look at uh, SpaceX saying, but why don't we reach the rocket instead of throwing it in the ocean? You know, that's an, that's an outsider's point of view. NASA didn't come up with that. And all of the rocket, uh, the rocket engineers prior to that, they maybe wanted to, but there wasn't a way to put the pieces together because they couldn't think of it unless you're an outsider and you start from scratch and you don't know what it is you can't do. Well, Stacey Spikes, thank you for the conversation. Uh, tell us why people should pick up uh, Black Founder. Kev, I wrote the book to try and, you know, pay forward the lessons that I learned, uh, the opportunities that I was given. And I wanted to make sure that every startup or tech founder or person of color or woman or just somebody who has an idea that they want to bring into reality, that they had something that they could use as a starting point to how do I, how do I make a company? How do I do it? What if I, what if I didn't go to a school? What if I don't look like the right color on the right sex? Um, can I still do it? And the answer is yes. And here's how, and that's why I wrote Black Founder. I'd like to squeeze in one more question. You said that, um, not to say I'm paraphrasing. You didn't, you don't believe there's failures. It's just learning. Yeah. Um, have you always had this mentality? I mean, that's a very healthy way of looking at things. Have you always felt that way? Or is that something that just you developed over time? You know, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a, I grew up in Houston. And so grew up in the backyard of NASA. And I think when we were kids, we, we got a aerospace engineering kind of childhood. Like that's the way you were raised. And I think I've always had a sense that engineering that 
says that was a failure. It says, oh, we learned that if you don't do this on the rock, it, it can cause it to go this way. Well, that's none of that's failure. So each time you're getting better and better and better and better. And I think a lot of times people get discouraged uh, when you look at Albert Einstein, when you look at Thomas Edison. Thomas Edison had more than a thousand light bulbs in work before one finally did. And I think as long as you can, uh, B. Smith, the famous restaurateur, uh, she had a saying, you have to stand on a mountain of you know, who's the privilege to yes. And if you just imagine you getting closer to yes, then you understand there is no failure and there is no, it's just closer to the, the answer or the getting through the opportunity the right way. All right, Stacy Spikes, thank you for writing my autobiography of the life I never lived. <laughs> it's, it's still coming, Kev. It can happen. Don't give it up. It can hope. happen. It can happen. It can happen. Real quick question. You're from Houston. Yeah. I, I jumped on Houston when Paul Wall and Slim Thug and those guys came out. Who are your favorite Houston artists? Oh, man. I, you know, I got one thing make me do. I'm not going to do that. Damn it. I love them all. <laughs> I love them all. They're all spectacular. Ghetto and boys, that, everybody. And ladies and gentlemen, that's why he's a CEO. <laughs> 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 all right, there, Thanks, sir. Joe. Thank you for the conversation. Thank you have you, a good day. Friend. Thank you. you. Too.